اسراف We're back. And we're back. So sorry for that. I know more about Lime than I do technology, and I have no idea why that happened. So I apologize. But we'll make it work. We'll do the best we can with it. Um, and so as not to prolong your evening, um, hoping that all of you are still with us and others have a chance to join, to finish my thought that was perhaps cut off, uh, just a note of gratitude and thanks for those who've been supporting the meals we've been producing and for supporting the efforts that Field Remains put forward. It's meant a great deal to us. Uh, I think the, the community bonds that have formed um, prior to this experience were strong and they only continue to get stronger day by day. And so thank you for, for that. Hi, Steve. Hi, Foxes. How are you guys? Um, all right, so let's start. I hope you have your wine. It's ready to go, opened. It could be decanted. But yours is wrapped in paper, um, so it doesn't have to be. And let's start and look at where this particular wine is going to take us this evening. We're going on a journey. Um, I've spent the last week kind of watching a couple of others who are doing this too, and uh, some good points were made along the way of a couple of videos that I watched. And some were critiquing the exercise of blind tasting in other videos, and that's fair. I mean, it's it's sort of a parlor game. Does it mean that you uh, are, are better at experiencing or enjoying wine uh, if you can get a wine right in a blind tasting context? And um, I, I take a little bit of issue with that, that critique. I think if you're doing this for the master sommelier exam, um, it doesn't necessarily equate to being a, a better server of wine if you can blind taste something. But I think for, for those of us who are on this call tonight, the exercise of evaluating a wine that's in front of us without us having any knowledge of it, what it is, helps to heighten our senses about the wine, helps to give us a better stand, understanding and appreciation for the details, the nuances that exist in wine. I think as your information and your understanding and your knowledge of wine increases, so too does your appreciation and your enjoyment. And so let's dive in and begin to enjoy what's before us. All right, so what do we do first? Look, what do we see? It's red. <laughs> so we get to rule out white, sparkly, rosé, sweet uh, fortified wines. Uh, perhaps it could be port, right? So um, we're still in two of the sort of five camps. And we have a red wine principally. We start to look at it and evaluate what we see. If you have a white piece of paper at home and some better light, uh, that's a good thing. If you don't, it's not the end of the world. Again, these are all just little factors that help to get a better sense of the wine. Um, does the wine look like it has a little bit of bubble to it? Not really, right? So I think we're in a still red wine category. The color is, what would you call it? Matt, yeah, Matt, Mr. Fitzsimmons, Matthew, pour. Yes, go ahead, pour. <laughs> Sorry, I've jumped ahead. People are talking about dinner, um, good. I'm glad that the, the last lingering taste of dinner are there. We're about to have some of this wine. Did anybody drink this wine with dinner? Not knowing what it was and began to work on, on the, the blind tasting before we actually started. Ruby, Krista, yes, I think you're right on the color. So our little our spectrum sheet here that we, we use that we have kind of cobbled together by way of the Court of Master Sommelier's grid sheet and WSET grid sheet and our own modifications runs for colors in the red wine spectrum, sort of at one end of purple, sort of in the middle ruby and then garnet and sort of tawny, tawny brown, brown kind of profile. So principally most red wines that you're gonna find are gonna have uh, either a pur purple cast to it, a ruby red cast or a garnet kind of cast, but um, dark violet, is a beautiful descriptor. Amelia says ruby. But Taylor, I'll, I'll go with dark violet. That's nice. Um, it's important to note here that while you might have a right answer, wrong answer kind of situation, um, whatever language you're using and that helps you be the reference point and also convey the information to someone else so that they can understand it is the point. 
Now, if you're going for a diploma or a degree um, or a certification of some sort, they're very specific about what one color means. And those colors have uh, indications or tells towards certain varietals in certain places. And so that's kind of nice. <laughs> Steve Millet is already a bottle of Chianti deep. So you're going to be running fluid with this. Thanks. Rick Tag has always had a drink at least somewhere in him throughout the day. Hi, Rick. <laughs> Um, so I'm sure we're, we're, we're well lubricated and, and on our way. Um, I've tasted a few wines today, but not, not too many. So I have to catch up to some of you. All right, so we're at Ruby uh, or a dark violet. Um, Ruby red variety. So let's talk a little bit about color and what we could learn from color, right? So it's, if it was purplish, it would be darker skin, deeper, richer kind of varieties that you might see having more of a purple characteristic. Ruby gives you a, a broader spectrum, I think. Purple sort of is a little bit more concise. So Ruby could be anything from Gamay and Pinot Noir up to Merlot, um, but you have a pretty wide spectrum. Uh, so it doesn't tell us necessarily a whole lot about the wine right off the bat. Um, what you can look at though too is, is there a little variation from the outside? If you kind of tilt the glass a little bit, and you're looking down on it, the rim is on the outside, and then you have a oh, rim of meniscus right there. So there's kind of a, a little variation touch. And then does the wine go through any sequences of flavor? Are there rings of color, I should say, rings of color that are differentiated? And if they are, what does that tell you? Um, so you've got kind of a watery rim, and then there's sort of a light, faint kind of real ruby color, and then it goes a little bit deeper and richer. If you have more gradation and variation there, it might be an indication of, of age, of a wine that has settled out with some time. So color in wine comes principally from the skin, um, or almost all sensibly, totally from the skin. Some juice, so a very small amount of, of juice. Uh, Norton, for example, is one that if you press the grape, the actual juice comes out tinted red. Most of the grapes in the world, let's say 99% of them, 98% of them, when you press the grape, the juice is clear. And so the color comes by way of soaking that juice with the skins. And those skins, depending on how thick or thin they are, how much time the juice spends on those skins, the conditions of the fermentation indicate or derive in a certain amount of color. And that's what we're working with here. In time, that color, the pigmentation that comes, falls out in the way of tannin in the form of sediment. And so sometimes you'll get a variation in the wine because of that aging process. Um, what would you call, sorry, question. Um, Julie's here to my side. Um, so, we're at a ruby color, and would you call this sort of uh, intense in, a, in, in appearance? Would you say it's light, medium, full-bodied in terms of its intensity? Is it really rich? Can you see through it? Could you not see through it? Where would you put it? I don't think it's terribly light, but I, I wouldn't call it like super deep dark either. Uh, I think the intensity here is kind of medium. You know, it has, a lightish character at the rim, but it's pretty, pretty red. It's, it's relatively opaque there. So it's a richer wine by way of that, right? Medium, looks rich. Yeah, Steve, exactly. Uh, Scott, I agree, it's medium. There's there's a power to this. I'm initially thinking right off the bat, right, that this is probably not Gamay or not Pinot Noir. It, it's more akin to something like perhaps Merlot or Dolcetto or Something along those lines. Medium to deep, carry, yep. Medium, so we're gonna agree, it's medium. Yay, <laughs> we've done it. Um, now let's look at uh, the next phase. So we've looked at this, we've kind of determined that there's a medium richness to this. It's ruby in color. Um, it kind of shades to a certain series of, of uh, of great varieties, and yeah, to your point, Maureen, I think it's relatively young. Um, how does it smell? Mm 
Is the smell light, medium, pronounced? The aromas that you're getting, are they plentiful? Are there, are there numerous aromas that jump right out of the glass? A few aromas or not much at all? Is it not terribly expressive? What are you guys getting? For me, it has a, a, few, a few kind of pronounced notes, but not enough of them to sort of be very overt. Uh, so there's a, a moderate kind of medium amount of, of aromatic intensity and pronounced quality. It's definitely more than light. Um, so what are we smelling? Any fruits? Matthew said that some, some of the aromas have blown off a touch. Black fruit, a lot going on for Jan, a bit of vanilla. Okay, let's deal with fruit. So Michelle, uh, she's got some black fruit, medium aroma of Susan with uh, some ripe berries, yep. Hi Alicia, welcome. We're on aroma. Alicia, put your nose in the glass and tell us what you smell. Cranberry and some oak. Matthew, uh, when you say oak, what are you smelling? What does oak smell like for you? Cinnamon, uh, Susan notes, blackberry, black fruits, plummy, yeah. Black cherry, fig. So that's interesting. So condition of fruit, we're going to talk a little bit about too, but we're talking right here about black fruit. Are we talking about black cherries? We're talking about blackberries. I've seen some plum and some fig. This is kind of, I'm going like this because there's a spectrum. I've got to figure out how to, how to move that correctly. Um, the uh, Steven's got a little bit of a, a, a precursor from his Chianti, thinking a little bit of violets. So there's a fall element too. But there's some dried fruit discussion in the way of raisins and perhaps the figgy element. There's some fresh fruit in the way of of the dark cherry. So we're kind of creating a spectrum here of some fresh fruit to, to dried fruit and otherwise really ripe fruit, right? A touch of alcohol smell. Jonathan's asking how far back we consider young. Um, I think I've told the story to a number of you before, but it just depends on the line, right? Um, but three years is a good indication sort of, of of the beginning point, but sometimes you're talking about things from say Rioja or other places in the world where their first release, kind of the Reserva um, Brunellos, for example, would be three to five years beginning. So that's brand new. And then young for that might be five to 10 years. Uh, and then they can age for longer than that. But I think a general estimate from, for young would be kind of release, which could be two years to sort of five, six years. Um, other wines that would be six years might be just absolutely peaked and past their prime. So it would depend, but yeah, let's just say for the pr purpose of this wine, you know, two to four years, two to five years would be in the, in the young range. Okay. So fruit, Steven said, Nicole's in the background yelling out a bit of current, which is interesting. Okay, good. So we've got definite fig notes, raisin notes, blackberry, black cherry, plum, it's a whole kind of spectrum of, of fruit notes. And when that happens, um, one thing to think about with respect to any glass that has a real pronounced sequence of flavor like that, uh, of aroma, excuse me, and flavor when we get to the palate, is to begin to consider a blend. Um, it's not to dictate that it is a blend per se. It's oftentimes very difficult for variety to give you a range of profile. You could have one variety picked like we had last week in the Chardonnay, for example, with it, some of that tropical quality, some of that high acid quality, and that could be more of the wine making that's making some variation and dimension in the wine, but we're already getting a really cool kind of mixture of fruit flavor here. And yeah, Glenn, tobacco for sure. So let's move from fruit, fruit to earth. And uh, so in the acronym FEW, we're gonna pick out a few things in wine. We're gonna pick out fruit, earth and wood profile. Some people have already noted a bit of the wood profile in the way of cinnamon and other things. Tobacco kind of falls under that sort of earth, if you will. Um, any mineral, any stone element, anything ferrous, bloody, any 
anything kind of hummus, earthy. Um, decomposed leaves, bark, manure, touched grass. Yeah, I don't need notes. Ash from Jan, yeah. It's also just wishful thinking that we could get the fire heart uh, roasting back here at the hearth. Yeah, that's fun, huh? How about anything kind of like leathery, smoky, wet wood, loam? Yeah, Steve, that's a great way to describe, describe a bit of that. Lindsay's uh, chiming in with some clove. Rick's, Rick's pointing to some mushroom. Uh, all of this is right, I think. Hey, Frank. Oh, I'm sorry about the wine, man. Um, but welcome along. I think you're an experienced enough taster that perhaps if our descriptions are good enough, you can help us figure out what this is. Yeah, for sure. I, I like to echo the, uh, the, the loam and the mushroomy that's definitely present here. It's, it's continuing to come out more and more. The, the, the pronounced element of pond that was noted earlier, kind of did dip for me too. It, it sort of went a bit, a bit more muted. That's why I sort of said it was medium in intensity. And, and now as I'm swirling this, and as you swirl wine, the alcoholic esters just kind of release and bring with it the aroma. So you're allowing the wine to kind of aerate, it aerates, it releases and gives you a little bit more. Yeah, we're getting a little clove, a little bit of cinnamon. Some people are saying not terribly oaky, much more of the earthen element, much more of the the vibe, perhaps or varieties that are, are available in this particular wine. Neutral old oak from Matt, yeah. Well, maybe we will confirm that on the palate. See, it's not a whole lot of oak, or maybe the oak is a lot more present on the palate, we'll see. So when you're doing this, you're starting to build this dossier, if you will, this structure of, of what this wine might be. And these lists, and we start to check things off, and we start to push things away that we're not really thinking about. Um, you think like, well, I got a little bit of oak on the nose. I got some clove. I got some cinnamon. I think there's a chance that there's a little bit of vanilla there, and there's then there's going to be some oak. What oak we'll see, perhaps we'll we'll revisit that again as we taste it. All right, so that earthen quality had a to best right now, um, and I don't mean varietal morning, but good. You're throwing Barbera out there. Um, would you put yourself in the old world or the new world? speaking, the new world gives you a little bit more primary fruit fruit characteristics and not necessarily those earthen characteristics. So I think the the intrigue might be in the way of the old world with this particular wine. So again, I'm just trying to kind of frame a sense of where do I think this wine is taking me? And presently, from the variety, uh, from, from the assessment that we've given it, it's taking me more old world than new world. But we'll, uh, we'll confirm all that. Hey, Anthony, how are you? <laughs> Good to have you here, at least virtually. Old, yep, yeah, old world. I agree. All right, let's taste it. First taste, just let's work with taste as opposed to flavor. Is this wine sweet or dry? And you'll feel that on the finish, right? So as it lingers in your mouth, is there a sweetness there? Is there a sugariness there? And this wine has a, plays a little bit of a trick on you there, I think. I mean, it's it's got a fruit element at the finish and a little bit of alcohol that kind of swings up. That makes it feel just a tiny bit sweet but it's dry. This is a dry wine. I concur, Kimberly. Yes, we're on the same page there. And Matthew, yes, it does have a bigger mouthfeel. Um, so it's a dry wine. What's the acidity like? Are you salivating still? Is it a low level of acidity? Is it a moderate level of acidity? Is it a high, high level of acidity? Yeah, Taylor, the sweeter than dry comment from Taylor. Yeah, I think it's it's wine that does play a little bit of a trick on you in the finish. It's got a little bit of sweetness in the way of the fruit component that is in the wine. Couple 
problem with the texture and a little bit of the alcohol plays a little trick, but as you linger and let it kind of, the taste dissipate, there's no residual sugar or sweetness there. There's a sweet profile of fruit, but we'll get to that. Uh, not quite the same. So yeah, I think we're talking about medium, moderate acidity, maybe even moderate plus. It's kind of like in uh, the restaurant world where someone orders a steak and they say, I like my steak medium, not medium well, not medium, medium plus. And this is, uh, yeah, Carrie, we're still salivating. This is, this is medium plus. I don't think it's super gripping acidity, but uh, the, the tannins are exactly as those Maureen notes, sneaky. Mm -hmm. They are, they, they don't hit you up front. They come in in the middle, the volume gets a little bit louder and then they linger and the tannin acid kind of interplay there creates that moderate plus, I think, experience on the palate. Yeah, I'm salivating too, Carrie, it's, it's still happening. Uh, so let's talk about tannin about this tannin it's is it a short experience of tannin is it a long experience of tannin is it really big dense powerful tannin that is full um, kind of high tannin profile is it a moderate tannin I think uh, it's not really on the light side of tannin so where would you put it medium to high Or one place, right? It's when you have it in your mouth and you're kind of swirling it around. You'll see wine folks kind of take the wine in. And swirl it swish it around. All but garbage. So this, um, this wine kind of has reputation um, and tannin versus acidity acidity is uh, is what you're going to perceive sort of on the sides of your uh, your tongue underneath your tongue the acid compounds in the wine uh, reference uh, a different experience than the tannin and the tannin as you swish a swish swish a swirl and swish it around in your mouth excuse me will bond to protein and bonds. kind of like a cotton ball stuck up in there, um, you'll need a, a toothpick. Um, it will, um, Frank, here goes the wine color. It will give you um, that drying sensation. And that can be very different from wine to wine with respect to tannin. Um, so yeah, it's definitely more of a moderate kind of tannin profile. It's a little bit chalky or chunky. There are some tannins that are silky and long some people will call them long chain tannin that kind of link one to the next experience. This tannin kind of, as it was pointed out earlier, is sneaky. It kind of comes on and presents, excuse me, um, a burst sort of at the second half of the experience here. So it's got a little bit of grip. It's got some power to it. It's got some acidity to it. And it's got some, some weight and some body. Uh, Kimberly's noting that sticks to the top and back part of the palate. It's interesting, yes, that sensation is a different experience with this particular wine, right? All right, so we've got tannin, alcohol. Feeling any burn? Are you getting any sensation in the back of your throat? There's a definite weightiness that's coming from this and it could be from the ripeness of the fruit. And the riper, remember, that fruit gets the higher potential alcohol uh, you have in a wine. So it could be from a warmer climate if it's got a higher alcohol, generally speaking, although there are indications otherwise. Um, and other places where that isn't necessarily the full case, but higher tannin, higher acid. Fox is saying it's, it's well-crafted. Yeah, Jan saying it's nice too. This team picks out nice wines, which is a good thing. Um, Jonathan's already venturing a guest for Super Tuscan. We've had Barbera thrown out there. I think both those are our good options. And Italy is sort of a, a place that people are focusing on. But let's work our way through taste and we'll come back to that. So alcohol, moderate again. So we're kind of off or dry, medium plus acidity, uh, a sort of medium plus tannin profile. 
alcohol being targeted between 13 and 14 by Kimberly. That's, that's really cool. Nice and specific. Yeah. It's a, it's not 14, 15 plus. It doesn't feel like that. Um, Frank Morgan's already thrown out Nebbiolo and I think that's a, a fair thought and certainly on my, on my radar too. How's the, um, the body? Is it silky and light? Is it muscular and sort of a medium profile? Is it really robust and full? It's definitely not silky and light. Um, I think it gives you uh, some robustness, but it's more in the muscular side, uh, thanks to some of that tannin. Um, yeah, Taylor, I agree. It's more muscular. It's medium, medium body. And how about the finish? So is it something that's short, lasts less than sort of 10 seconds? Uh, is it something that's sort of between 10 and 30 seconds, that's sort of a moderate finish? Or is it a super long finish that goes 30 seconds and beyond. And that, you have a sip and just sit with it and relax with it. Matt, um, your question about robust versus muscular, those are just terms I use to kind of help to frame what medium versus full body would be. So in the world of muscle, think of, um, think of like Bruce Lee, you know, it's a little bit leaner, but super strong um, and powerful. Um, or if to put it in a way, like let's think about football perhaps, uh, and you've got a running back sort of in the moderate muscular but agile place, whereas you have the center who's much more robust and big. His capability is to just block and set, whereas the, the running back is able to move and juke and jive a little bit more. It has a little bit more vibrancy. Um, it isn't as powerful per se. It has power, but in a more limber way. Um, there are many thousands of descriptors that you could use to try to convey that information. But the muscular element for me is trim muscularity that kind of indicates in like this case, uh, a tannin profile, acidity profile that has this tension to it. Um, and it's a medium body. Another way to think about the body of wine uh, is the example of milk. So skim milk, 2% milk and whole milk. The, the profile and how it feels on your palate. Skim milk just sheets. It's kind of a one dimension, a flat sort of dimension on the palate. It goes down and back. Whereas 2% uh, milk or a medium body will kind of fill your mouth a little bit more. And then to that point further, whole milk will give you just this rounder profile, a richer profile, kind of an aerated profile that covers more of your mouth. Alexandria is just jumping in. Color concentration, yeah. Uh, color concentration, we were talking about it being kind of medium. All right, I'm, I'm starting to run out of wine. All right, so did we get to some things short, long, medium? Yeah, moderate, kind of medium, uh, medium finish. Good. And we've got a whole bunch of, of folks thinking about their initial conclusions or their even final conclusions being Italian in focus. And I think that's appropriate, right? When we're talking about acidity that's relatively old world that we kind of determined from the beginning. Um, and then we can kind of confirm on the palate, right? And then we're looking at uh, profiles of high, higher moderate tannin and moderate plus acid. But let's wait before we get there and kind of touch base on a little bit of the fruit that we're tasting, the earth that we're tasting, the wood that we're potentially tasting, as opposed to just smelling. What are we getting on the palate? Can we confirm the spectrum? Do we get black, blackberry, plum, raisin, fig? A couple of Malbec, which has got tossed, which is good. So dark fruit, dark plum, plum for sure, maybe fig. It's 
Spanish or Portuguese? Jan's confirming yes and yes to everything about <laughs> that's right. So one part of this exercise, right, is all this mental exercise, this deductive process where we're just kind of working our way through this grid and asking all questions and trying to determine what's right. And the other part that I think is worthwhile, and we'll do that here in just a second with the next sip, is just to sit with it, take a sip, and just sort of let the answer come to you, see what comes up. Um, raisin, we're more on the raisin side, the black cherries there, we're a little bit riper in profile, the is there so anything earth we still are we getting the kind of the loam that we talked about the mushrooms that we talked about from the aroma are those pleasant on the on the palate So some raisin, some mushroom. Yeah, I'm getting some of that raisin on the back end of this finish. Uh, some element, a little bit less of that sort of fresh black cherry quality that was present on the nose, but quite the same presence uh, on the palate. There's some second guessing happening uh, in the way of uh, Jeff coming from the, the new world versus the old. Yeah, there's a there's a ripeness to this fruit that would suggest potentially that we could consider, for example, Malbec from uh, from the new world from Argentina that was thrown out there. Less mushroom on the palate. It's more about the in the palate, right? Uh, that's how I'm I'm reading it for sure. There's there was more mushroom and earthen aroma. Uh, the loamy aroma, the aromas that were coming off were, were more akin to uh, the secondary flavor characteristics. They're not quite as at least dominant or as present at the present moment in, in the wine on the palate. So let's do a, a quick recap. Um, we've got kind of a rubyish color that looks a little bit youthful, that has a moderate kind of intensity to it, an aroma that's a moderate plus intensity with a variability to it as it opened up, it, it, it expressed more. It was expressive of sort of a spectrum of, of fruit flavors, right? It was black cherry all the way to fig uh, with plum and some raisin in there. It was, it is, it is um, a wine that had a little bit of some cinnamon, some clove on the aroma, so some oak profile. Um, are we getting that oak on the wine now? Are you picking up any spice? A lot of uh, folks chiming in with Malbec and Bernillo. And I think that the fruit profile is kind of helping us get to that point. Yeah, that's a possibility. So we work our way through. Um, blend old world. Yeah, I remember about the aroma up front, how it was diverse in its range of profile and that there was a potential that this would be a blend. And so let's talk a bit about places then. We've got... Argentina Malbec thrown out there. We've got Portuguese red, Spanish red. We had uh, Northwestern Italy in terms of Barbera kind of thrown out there. We had uh, Brunello thrown out there from Tuscany. We had Brunello uh, just by way of description also thrown out there. Um, anything else we want to consider? Why do you want to rule out Italy, Stephen? Jonathan's thrown out Rapasa, which is a good call, right? As something to consider for a, uh, a wine that would be from Italy, these raisiny characteristics. Do we have enough alcohol, kind of a warmth to be from the Rapasa production? 
possibly. Uh, Rick Tag is saying France, and I think that's a good question. Like we should rule out France, right? So let's start taking things out of the equation. We've got a pretty long list, right? We got to get New World and Old World under two, but let's work our way through France, for example, just because we're talking about it now. Is it Bordeaux? We talked about Malbec, which is Bordeaux great. Do we see the potential of being a, a really ripe vintage in Bordeaux? Um, it, it had from our initial descriptions, right, kind of a blend potential, and that's where you'd find a blend potentially coming from Bordeaux uh, or the Rhone. We'll get there in a second. Bordeaux giving you some current, which was talked about before. Certainly that spectrum, Merlot dominant blend, the right bank giving you plum for sure. Um, so do we could be in that realm? I think the raisiny quality of it would say not as much, right? So the profile that we're tasting, if it was more on that red currant, black currant, blackberry, plum, that's a little bit fresher, we might kind of venture more toward France. So for the purposes of this, I think let's put, let's put uh, France out of it. Um, how about we take Mar Argentina then, Malbec and Argentina? Um, there's a good argument. Um, I think depending on the producer, um, that earthen quality is something I don't typically get, but say for example, Bodegas Wine, which we have here, um, they make very old world style production of, of varieties um, in, in Argentina. And it could be that, and I think that would be a pretty cool guess on this front. Um, it has an amplitude to it, right? We have a, a richer profile to it, but muscular in quality. And so um, that's, that's a possibility, but then that wouldn't be blend in orientation, that'd be a varietal. Um, what about uh, the Rhone? Anybody thinking about the Rhone? Could this be a Grenache-based blend from the southern part of the Rhone Valley? Scott, would the Malbec have more earth, you're asking? I, I don't think it would necessarily have more earth per se. Um, it just depends on the producer and, and where it's coming from um, specifically. But generally speaking, uh, a Malbec, I don't know that it would have this presentation of, of earth. Um, and, and Jeff, I'm not thinking it's below the equator. I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm more along the lines of sort of a, a Portuguese red or a Spanish red. I think I'm, I'm centering it on that. Yeah the profile of of this giving me more of that raisiny fruit that really ripe warm sun you can get certainly hot qualities and some riper elements that come by way of uh of the rhone but usually you get a, a red fruit character too that kind of accompanies them and so could be very wrong there but a spanish red or a portuguese red sounds about right the ripasso style uh from valpolicella um and the amarone area and east of italy is also a very fair and very interesting call here. Uh, so how do we get down to that? Rioja from Chad is a, is a good guess. The tannins here have a quality about them that um, isn't as persistent and I'm not getting the signature kind of, of as much wood. Um, this could be sort of a Crianza level production. So in the world of, of Rioja, they have a couple of different tiers and sort of more of the entry level tiers don't have quite the same amount of oak aging. So it would give us a little bit, perhaps not as much. And so that could be the ability. Um, but the tannin here is a little bit more refined and, and elegant and classy. And I think you might get that more from something like a Doral Red. Yep, yeah, which uh, Lindsay just put out there. Yeah, it tastes the Tariga. For sure, I think that's a possibility, right? So we're getting sort of that raisiny character and a little spectrum of, of fruit and the the richness and the ripeness, the raisiny element could be coming from the uh, the region of the Douro River or the Portuguese, uh, if you're in, in Oporto and you kind of head east along the Douro River, you have where most of port is produced, uh, these wonderful vineyards, old terraced vineyards along the river that also make just remarkably wonderful red wines. Um, and I think, yeah, as we sort of center in on that, I think this, if you put your nose back in the glass and then take a taste and just sit with it for a second, what does it remind you of? Close your eyes, try not to think, just let it kind of become the conduit uh, and let the wine speak to you. What, what do you taste?
yeah, for me, I think I'm going to center in on, on, on the old world. I'm going to go with a, a Portuguese red blend, a little bit of that Tariga. And uh, yeah, I, th- I think that's where I'll put my guess. So 2000, we said young, so two to five years of age range. I think we could say like 2017. Dwarrel Red. It's going to be my guess. Anybody else have anything to say otherwise? <laughs> you certainly can. But that's where I'm going to put my my final uh, in the ground. And Jane gets coffee now. <laughs> All right, Julie what, Julie, what do we have? Here we go. Oh, yeah, we did it. Yeah. Quinta de la Rosa. They have a fantastic terraced vineyard that is remarkable. Um, and they make really lovely ports. And um, as Lindsay pointed out, like, there's just that sort of Tariga kind of quality. There's a little porty element on the, on the, on the nose when you stick in it now, especially now that you know what it is. Um, and it just it presents that way. There's a tannin structure that really speaks to pedigree. And these wines have just phenomenal old vine material that is put into red wines. And the house is built on port. The red wines are starting to come on as, as being every bit of, of the quality and, and intrigue for relatively wonderful prices. And so this is the, the bottle. Quinta de la Rosa. This is 17. Did I say 17 or did I say 16? I said 17. <laughs> um, this is great. Cool. Thank you all very much for, for playing along. My father-in-law um, last week said, you know, why didn't you talk about what these wines go well with in the way of food? And he's quite right to note that. So what would you eat with wine? Now, if you have any left of it, I'm, I'm running a little bit thin on this, but um, yeah, Jonathan, exactly. We, 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 we nailed it because it was nice. I was sort of heading down that Italian quite a few folks chimed in and talked a little bit about Portugal and and that's it so it's fun to do this together uh, blending wise this is a blend sorry uh, to the question of the blend it's Tariga Nacional 40% Tinta Rorige 30% and Tariga Franca 30 <laughs> 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 yeah, we're going to pick out Cerciel versus Buol. What, what vintage? That'd be fantastic fun. Um, so anyway, what does this go with? What are you going to drink with this with? For the remainder of your bottle, if you could make a meal, what would you put with it? Well, the tannins give you some real structure, um, but there's a, a still a freshness to this in its youth. And so with anything that you want to downplay tannin with, if you don't want to experience that tannin in that youth, you can take for one to aerate it a bit and let it soften. You pair with things that have a creaminess, a richness, uh, a fattiness, or a rareness. Uh, as I mentioned before about that tannin experience, it's bonding to the the protein in your gums, it'll also bond to the food. Um, and you give it a little bit of a richer, creamier sauce. If you give it um, a rarer, medium rare, medium even steak of some sort, that will, that will bond beautifully to this. But you could, I think, play with a, a nice, beautiful braise. We're kind of in that shoulder season from winter into spring right now. But if you had some short braise them, <laughs> you had barbacoa the other day. Thank you, Jonathan, uh, for the plug there. That would be fantastic. Um, absolutely. Uh, the highest here would be fun with a tomato-based braise or a red wine-based braise. Uh, of some, it would be great. I picked up remember a little bit of that cherry characteristic. If you, if you kind of did some cherry, you did a little bit of um, a braise of some dried cherries with red wine and some stock and cook that down for a period of time. Put that stock sauce over. Roasted duck, that would be really nice too. So, 
These are our beautiful wines. They go with a lot. And in the restaurant, we use these wines, especially with respect to cooking over the, over the hearth. And so that char element goes well with a little bit of the tannin that's here on some roasted meats. And this, this sort of ample fruit element is a nice counterpoint or foil for that roasted quality. So question coming from my mother, is this wine best chilled or at room temperature? And probably because of the tannin profile, more at room temperature. If you chill it, the tannin becomes more pronounced and everything else becomes more muted. So uh, I, would, I would leave it out uh, at room temperature. And think of room temperature from the olden days of the chateau. So room temperature about 60-ish degrees, not 80 degrees, depending on who you are and what your room is temped at. So cheers to everyone. Thank you so much for playing along and for joining us uh, here at Field Man. We do it, and I, as I said, I look forward to this every week, and we'll be back next week to do it again. Cheers. Thank you.